It's so good to see you. It's wonderful to have you. For those of you who don't know you, this is Phil Thomas Cat, VJ, DJ, musician, host of the Uncharted Zone, and the person that put me on the air the first time on the radio. And I can't help, I can't help but just, just, it's wonderful to have you. Well, I'm certainly glad to be here. And uh, I've got to say, it was certainly my pleasure to play your record for the first time on the air. Now, listening to so many music songs, as they say, they are music songs. Some things are not music, but they are songs. Playing music songs, how do you know which songs speak to you? Are you your music or are you something else? Honestly, if, if you're referring to the radio show, I uh, I always have to dig the song, and in order for me to dig it, it's got to move me in a certain way. And there's lots of various ways that I believe a, a song can move one. Let's talk about Mark Gormley, because another side of you is making music videos and doing quite well. 4.5 million views mark gormley how did you meet mark gormley well i was doing the uh, local television show at the time and uh martin just called me up like a number of local musicians did at the time because this was before we went viral or anything and uh he called up and wanted to do a music video and so i said yeah and he came over and we did it and you know when i first heard his song especially little wings it just was amazing. I'd never heard anything like it. And it, it was his talent always bottled up? I mean, was this, when he came to you, where was he at in his, his, his music landscape? Well, he had recorded his stuff because he didn't record here. He recorded back in the 80s and uh, I believe some in the 70s as well. And uh, he even recorded in Europe at one point. And so... Uh, he had all of his music recorded. All he really wanted was to do a music video like the other artists on the Uncharted Zone. How would you describe yourself and, and, and your life and how you got here? Hmm. I mean, it's a lot to sum up in one little thing, but <laughs> I mean, how did you, did you always love music? I suppose that's the first question. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was always into music and DJing and uh, being a musician myself. I, well, I say always. Actually, I started writing songs myself in my early teens. And which instruments are you a master of? <laughs> I don't know that I would call myself a master of any of them, but uh, I play guitar and I play uh of course, the synthesizer or keyboards, even a piano for that matter. And uh, I can also play bass a little. But a lot of what I do these days, and it wasn't like that in the early days for sure, but what I do these days is I program a lot of stuff. Oh, you make electric dance music, basically. Yeah, you. I don't know that you would always call it dance music. Some of it for sure, but... Uh, it's mostly just uh, musical soundtracks for the uh, for the lyrics that I write that I've been writing for many many years for that matter. And what is your process? Do you have the music first or the lyrics first, or how do you how do you how do you do that? Well, to me, it was always the lyrics first. By these days, anyway, in the early, early days, I was playing guitar and, you know, just singing along with it. But for the most part now, I have a lot of lyrics and I'll, I'll go in and I'll take something that I wrote years ago and tweak it up a bit. Or I'll just start fresh and uh, create something from there. Because this is what I deal with, is, is that I, I don't play any instruments, so I could not, uh, you know, calibrate, uh, put together what I would want musically from my lyrics. So I get, you know, Daniel White makes a lot of my music. Daniel will send me something and I will, I will just come up with something off of that because I could never describe what, what I want originally, you know. But I guess everyone's different, you know. 
Well, you know, I can I hear what you're saying, and I can I can dig that because I have done that. I've had people send me a a soundtrack, or or even I commissioned a soundtrack, and uh, I would create lyrics to that. But uh, for the most part, I guess I, I I'm a lyric person first, and then uh, then I add the music later, or at least I add music to lyric to. Uh, I add lyrics to music that I already have. And what starts for you? One, one, just one lyric out of, of no, this sounds good, or I like the, the, um, the harmony of what I'm saying. Is that, do you get just a flash first, or do you get, how much comes to you f- first? A lot of times it's, it's a title, and that's not always the title that, that remains, but like the, the tune that I wrote with my friend David Blade, share your woman with me. That was uh, that came straight from a title, and we just built it from that. And where did that idea come from? I want your woman. Was it? I want your woman. <laughs> it's, it's... Well, honestly, I was um, at the time. This was back in the '80s when we wrote this. But at the time, I was dating this girl, and she had this other boyfriend, and I didn't like that so much. But uh, I decided the best thing to do was just be open about it. And what did you say? I says, dude, would you share your woman with me? And what did he say? He wasn't really into the idea, but you know, you know how things go sometimes. And from from these ideas and these titles, because it's interesting that you say I work with the title first. It's almost like, you know, most people write the book and then title it, but you come up with the title first. Why do you think that is? Are you just, is, is it almost like uh, you're writing an essay when you write a, a poem? It's like, I know this is my assignment. Well, in some respects, that that sums it up very well. But it's not always the title that I work from. It's just, that's one of my techniques. All right, I want to read a couple questions. These are questions from uh, fans. This is from the Patreon account. This is Tarina Pickett, and she writes, What's the weirdest gift a fan has ever given you? (laughs) The weirdest gift a fan has ever given me. Hmm. Let me think about that a bit, and I'll come back to it. All right, she's got one more. She's got the Double Tuesday. Um, This is also from Tarina Pickett. If you could be anyone other than yourself, who would you be? If I could be anyone other than myself, who would I be? That's a good question, too. Um, I do dig being me, I've got to say, but, I mean, if I were really to, to... dig in there you know I think I would enjoy being Elvis he seems that he had a very nice career up until the end of course what about Steve Perry because people would say you you would look you resemble Steve Perry you must get that all the time yeah I have gotten that and back in the days when my hair was uh, let me say white and blonde and spiked up I was even getting Rod Stewart references Rod Stewart interesting now When's the last time someone has seen your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was at Jazz Fest uh, last weekend, I believe it was. And I was doing a break with a fan that kind of stopped me out there and uh, wanted to say hello. And so I just pulled the phone out and did a live video. And I actually forgot to put my sunglasses on. So I would say last, last Saturday. And was were everyone swarming and taking pictures? And here he is. He's, he's coming out. You know. <laughs> well, no, because you know it's happened in the past. I mean, if you look at the old stuff, I wasn't wearing glasses then. I started wearing glasses, sunglasses. You know, probably in the two thousand, somewhere along in there, maybe the two thousand teens. And, but. Uh, and- what prompted that? I mean, what made you want to wear sunglasses? And were you holding back something in yourself that you didn't want to share or didn't want to, uh, you know, um, accessorize with? I mean, why did the glasses go on? Well, wow. 
that's a that's a good question and uh, you know I, I'm not sure that I should reveal that but uh, you can make something up <laughs> I can actually make something up okay here's one then back in the day no, oh, it's, give us well give us just a fraction of what you want to say give us just a fraction I mean because I understand I'm wearing glasses right now too so there's it's obviously a, a I didn't always wear glasses either but my reasons are probably very different than yours because I want to have almost an aesthetic feel you know and I, I look at a colored glass so it's almost you know this it's it's extra extra you know it's you know it's something else and something you can't put your finger on I'm talking too much but Give us just a fraction of what it is that you do with your glasses. and. <laughs> well, you know, I can dig what you're saying there, too, because in a lot of ways, I enjoy dimmer lighting, low lights. And I'm not sure why that is, but I keep my studio kind of lit low. And even in um, my viewing room for where I watch television and stuff, uh, I keep lighting low in there. And so I think in some respects, wearing the sunglasses allows me to mimic that in environments where other people maybe don't like that low lighting like I do. And do you find it calms you down? Yes, I do, actually. Yes, that's it's also a, what I, that's what I feel It's very relaxing. Too. It indeed is. Yeah. And, and, and another reason for it was Tommy was coming over a lot back in those days. Now tell people who Tommy was. Tommy Robinetti worked with me for many years. We worked with one another in radio as well. And uh, he was uh, he's a very funny guy. He's kind of retired now, but uh, back in the day we had some fun times. Can you, can you talk about those fun times without um, uh, breaking the senses? <laughs> no. Uh, Oh, talk about Tommy as far as, it, it, Tommy the one that got you, how did he push you? I know he must have pushed you in, a, in the right direction. How did he push you? <laughs> I think it was more like I kept Tommy reeled in a little bit. Um, so it was like a fishing line. <laughs> indeed it was. Um, Tommy could have, uh, could have stepped over the line on many occasions. And I did try to keep him reeled in because we were doing, you know, local television in the early days, and uh, things like that just weren't quite tolerated. What what, what was tolerated? What, what what did they mandate as far as what you did in your shows on public? Because I know I did public access for a moment, and. I know that they were, oh, well, you better have a librarian on. You know, you have to have this community thing, or you better film the open space. You know, just, did you find that that there was a, almost a mandate for what you did on public access? Well, it wasn't actually public access because I actually paid for the airtime and then sold commercials around it. But uh, there were restrictions, I might say. We had a, an artist back in the day named uh, Rusty McHugh. One of the funniest guys I've ever seen. And uh, he wrote some crazy songs. One of them he wrote was, I never met a bitch that could eat so much. And it was a very funny song, but it got us, uh, well, I won't say reprimanded, but they didn't dig it over at the station, that's for sure. But did, but did they allow you to play it? Well, I did play it. We had... Um, I mean, did you play it? Did you play it once, or did they did you did, did they let you continue to play it and frown on you? <laughs> it's more like B. Um, I didn't play it so much in our uh, afternoon show. We did a Friday afternoon show and a Saturday midnight show and a Friday midnight show. I I, I was able to get by with it on the late night shows. And that was what years? This was um, mid nineties. Talk about your, your following. You have a cult following. You have a very nice, juicy cult following. <laughs> How does it feel to have that? And, and, and what is it? And, and where does it come from, in your opinion? Well, I, I actually think a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that I was able to promote real well. Back in the day when I was just doing my own 45 RPM records, I uh, 
I was able to get airplay on local stations and even regional stations for that much, for that matter, because I continued to promote and it became kind of a skill or a talent or whatever you want to call it. And I think that had a lot to do with the fact that I was able to build that so-called cult following. And um, then I began to do things that were, uh, I don't know, for for local things, maybe a little bit controversial. And how so? Give me an example. Well, Christmas Eve one year, back in the 80s, I had an answering machine that had gained a huge local following. And uh, it was kind of crazy, but I was able to sell my cassettes, or at least promote them, right on the answer machine, and we sold a heck of a bunch of them. But one Christmas Eve night, I did a message where I says, Hi, Phil Thomas Cat here. Santa called and said he had a terrible headache and asked me, Phil Thomas Cat, to make the rounds for him. So leave your doors and windows unlocked tonight so I can get in. So it was something like that. And so parents of these, I guess, teenagers were calling the phone company because that's all they could complain to. The phone company shifted them over to the uh, sheriff's department and they called me. And uh, they were asking me, what the heck am I doing, you know? And so, of course, I, I told them it was just, you know, I'm getting ready to release a new album. It's kind of a publicity stunt. After I told them I was a musician, they says, oh, you're a musician. And it kind of backed down. But uh, until then, they thought I was some crazy guy, I think. So you, you, you are a promotional whiz kid. You are someone who uh, can, for whatever reason and by any means... Like, I, I bet you're very good with email addresses, aren't you? Well, you I used to those? be. I, I'm more into the uh, social media stuff now and YouTube. But uh, at one time, I did have one heck of a uh, an email, uh, I guess you'd say, address book. So you must have been a very good student as a child. Let's talk about your childhood. Would you? Uh, you, you must have been very attentive and done very well on tests and things like this which which is something you don't usually see from a musician you don't really see from a rock star you know they don't really do the algebra homework were you good in algebra <laughs> no you know there's where you've read me wrong jeff i've got to say it's because uh it's ditto i was a. Uh, <laughs> am sorry i'm sorry i'm thinking about my brother his name is jeff but anyway um i have uh I forgot what the question was now. Yeah, and I, I interrupted you. I interrupted you, and I'm sorry. We, I was talking about algebra, I believe. Yes, yes. And the answer to that is no. I was um, more into writing songs and trying to meet chicks. I was very similar. Um, however, um, as far as, you know, putting putting poetry down on onto paper, which is, I, I assume that's how you see it. I see, is it not poetry on paper when you write a song? Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, and, you know, that's definitely what it is. And all, all it's basically doing to make it to a song is just add music. Just like, just add water. When you're down, how do you pick yourself up? Honestly, music helps pick me up. I can listen to songs from whatever era I'm in the mood to, to be in. And uh, it can kind of take me back like a time machine. And so that, that kind of builds me up. What's a go-to song? If you had to pick any song to pick you up universally, which one would it be? Wow. That's hard to say, too, because... Um, I like different eras at different times. I mean, you know. But there must be one song that that beats out all the other songs. I mean, if you had to pack your bags and you could only fit one song, which song? <laughs> wow. I would say, for me, I would say Pet Shop Boys. Any oh. Pet Shop Boys song. But really, the one is It's a Sin. Oh, like man, it's funny you say that. That's the song that turned me on to the Pet Shop Boys. And I, I'm a big fan as well. I got to see them once at the Greek Theatre in 91. Oh. 
and I, uh, friends with all of them at some point, I was friends with all of them at different points of their lives, oddly enough, and I remember just hearing that sound, because, you know, you talked about making electronic sounds and, and things, I mean, they must be up there with, with the greatest of all time. You know, I think so. I, and I think they should have had a whole lot more chart action. I know they had some, that's for sure. But uh, they were greater than the public knew. I guess you could say they were ahead of their time. They were, they were a little ahead of their time. I mean, there were only two of them. And at a time when, you know, the, the other bands had four or five, there were only two. And, and the one... Not Neil Tennant, the other one, uh, would always have something on his head or, or something, you know, a, a giant hat or something. He's always, always trying to play second fiddle, and I, I, I find that almost a solo career move, you know. What's the longest song you've ever played as a DJ? Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Which is how long? I believe the version that I had was. Uh... <laughs> In the neighborhood of 20 minutes. Now, did you do that? Did you play that song because you wanted to go out and wash your car? Or, or, <laughs> I, mean, did you, I mean, what would be the reason for needing 20 minutes? Or, or was it just the song? It was just the song in that particular case. But what you're saying is, in my old radio days, that would have been a bathroom song. Something like Lion Eyes by the Eagles or even Stairway to Heaven by Zeppelin. Just to take a longer shower. Yeah, you can't re you can't really do that with a bath, can you? You take a bath; it's if the water is a certain temperature, and then it just goes down. You, you you can't really stay in a bath very long before getting chilly. That is indeed true, my friend. Now, what to talk? To, uh, another thing about you, people don't know, is that you're ambidextrous. Yes, yes, I am. I learned that as a child. Did you learn it for a reason, or did you just pick it up? Actually, I was, I just, I guess I just picked it up, if you, if you want to say that. Sometimes people say it's, you know, you're born that way. But um, I can recall I did everything with both hands. You know, I would eat with my left hand. I would write with my left hand. I would do the same thing with my right hands. But when I was in first grade, we had a parent-teacher conference. And my teacher said, uh, I only have one left-hand student. Philip. My mom says, no, he's not left-handed. He's ambidextrous. And so she says, well, we need to force him to write with his right hand because it's a right-handed man's world. And um, I don't I don't think that was a good thing to do. But it so doesn't I make started, any sense. No, it really doesn't. I started writing with my right hand because I was forced to by that teacher, Miss Grable. But, uh, I did everything else with my left hand, and still do, actually. But what is it that makes someone want to make someone write with their right hand? I mean, how would that throw a class off if you're, if you're, if you're left hand? Or how would that change the way you grow up as a man? You, you, you know, these things make no sense. What year was this? Oh, this was many, many years ago. Um, gosh, it was in first grade, so I'm, I'm probably way back in the um, in the sixties. And what is next for you? What do you see on the horizon? M more music videos? Yeah, I, I would actually like to work a little more on some of my music because I spend so much time, you know, doing music videos for other artists and things like that. It kind of takes away from, uh, you know, from my time to work on my stuff. And so I'm anxious to work on mine a little bit more for the future. And you got also, something in the ch you got something in the chamber, something oh, with the tees. I'm I'm always working on new songs. Another thing that I that I've often wanted to do is a sitcom. Um, I had I've gone through three ideas and nothing ever really happened with them, it, except one time we wrote some scripts and we were preparing to shoot. But you know how things like that are—they fall apart, and so it did. 
Well, they, they fall apart, but they, they can be glued together as well. You know, um, I would love to do a, a music video with you and I'd love to maybe develop something where maybe I am someone that was discovered by you and um, perhaps on a, a European backpacking trip. I'm just free bowling. I'm not really sure. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun, man. I would dig that. And I want to thank you and we're not finished with the interview. I want to let's get a couple more of these questions from fans. Um, what's another one? Um, well, I think we did most of them. Well, I mean, did you really did you really answer this question? How do you describe yourself? How do you see yourself intimately? Well, as far as an an image. I've often wanted to, uh, you know, portray that kind of mysterious image. And that was in the early days for sure. Well, the early, early days, I wanted to be a teen idol. But <laughs> nowadays, I'm pretty much into uh, comedy. I like comedy a lot, but I like it with an edge. And so I guess I see myself that way. One of those three things, probably the the second two more than uh in the first for sure so comedy is something that was it always seemed like comedy and music were, were, were each other's neighbors you know, somebody did comedy and somebody did music you know suddenly each of those people want to know each other better so you're entering into the more of the comedy playing on your persona playing on your image playing on your 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 sensibilities it's very exciting. Do you have any social media you want to plug? You want to you want to put your inter. Well, I I'm, I do Facebook. That's mainly what I do, and I do uh, YouTube with the Uncharted Zone. That's the Uncharted Zone so, channel. So look up Uncharted Zone, and Phil Thomas Cat. There's no, there's not another Phil Thomas Cat, is there? No, there are some. Uh, I guess you'd call them fake pages or whatever out there. Through the years, there's been several of those, but uh, none of those were me. I'm only on the one. Phil Thomas Katz, thank you for joining me, and welcome to The Jeff Richard Show. And this will be seen by at least three to four people. And um, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, I'm Dido Kiddo, and I'm sorry that Jeff couldn't be here, Phil, and I understand. He, he sends his uh, deepest uh, wishes and uh, thanks you for being you and coming on the show and so on and so forth. So, go ahead. I just would like to ask you, since you made it to the show, Ditto Kiddo, what is the inspiration for the song Boo? I love the team. It's, it's incredible, honestly. Well, I think boo, boo became, you know, I, think, you know, it's it's like the word boo. You know, people can scare someone by the boo. Yes. And then did I scare you? That was how it started, and you know, it ended up being a Halloween type of song. But you know, it can be played throughout the year. But you know, it was a Halloween song, and um, you know, Daniel White again brought the music, and uh, that's really how it is, and. I'm so glad that you like that song, and I'm so tickled that you continue to play it on your show. And um, maybe we can work together soon on something. I yeah. could always record myself over here and send you the, send you the video if you'd like to. I'd be honored, obviously. Well, that, would be, that would be fantastic, man. I would like that. Phil Thomas Cat for the hour. I'm Ditto Kiddo. For more of The Jeff Richards Show, you can go to thejeffrichardshow.com. We'll see you next time. Good night. It's my show.